Good evening. Good evening to you tonight. I'm Bill Schulz, the president of UUSC. I hope you've enjoyed your meals and are ready. Thank you. I hope you're ready for a very special program over the next 90 minutes. I have to first say that I have never seen so many coats and ties at a Unitarian Universalist event. And uh, congratulations, I won't see it again for 75 years. <laughs> a friend of mine recently turned 75 and told me that though he has long since retired, he's never been so busy in his life. I don't know how I had have time to work, he said. But then he added, of course, I didn't work very hard when I was employed. <laughs> and one reason I'm so busy now is I have so many doctor's appointments. But, be that as it may, 75 is an auspicious age, particularly for a human rights organization. Keep in mind that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which grounds all human rights work, was not adopted by the United Nations until 1948, eight years after the founding of UUSC. And Amnesty International, which I headed here in the United States for 12 years, was not founded until 1961. 19 years, 19 years after the birth of UUSC. We're very proud of our history, and in a moment I'm going to introduce you to some very special guests who personify that history. And we're also proud to say that UUSC never rests on its laurels, as, as you'll see in a few minutes when we show you a new video about our history and how it has informed our ongoing work today to bring innovative solutions to problems as diverse as the lack of water for the most vulnerable populations around the world, economic inequality, the degradation of women, wage theft from poultry workers, unjust treatment of immigrant children here in the United States. But before we tell you these stories, I want to introduce to you some of those who have made you USC, the path-breaking organization that it is today. And first, I'd like you to greet two of my predecessors as president of UUSC, Richard Scobie, who served from 1972 to 1998, Dick. <laughs> and, and Charlie Clements, who served from 2003 to 2010. Between the two of them, they represent 33 years of leadership to the organization, not quite half of our history. There are also, we, a few moment, moments ago, Lucia introduced our current board members. I know there are a lot of you who have served on the board in the past, and I'd like you to stand up and receive greetings as well if you've been on the UUSC board. Next, I want you to uh, meet two of our current partners who are with us tonight, and by their presence, they symbolically represent the more than 400 grassroots partner organizations around the globe with whom UUSC has worked over the past 75 years. There's first Johannes Burhan of Raices, the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services in San Antonio. <laughs> Johannes is in the back. Raices is bringing much needed justice to immigrants caught up in the American detention system. And I also want you to meet uh, one of our overseas partners, Tessie Fernandez and Ranieri Lucera of the Lihok Pilipina Foundation in the Philippines who are working to stop domestic violence and empower women throughout that country. Tessie and Ranieri. None of our work would be possible, of course, without the faithful financial support of so many of you, beginning with the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock, New York, which has supplied UUSC literally tens of millions of dollars over the years and matches every contribution you make of $125 or more. I can't say that too often 
So let's thank our friends from the Shelter Rock congregation. Stand up. Over the past two years, UUSC has been participating with five other Unitarian Universalist organizations, the UUA, Meadville Lombard, Star King School for the Ministry, Church of the Larger Fellowship, and the Minister's Association in the quiet phase of a coordinated campaign for special gifts designed, in our case, to more than double the amount of money UUSC has available for our programs and secure our financial future through at least 2019. And I'm delighted to announce tonight that the quiet phase of UUSC's campaign, which we call UUSC Rising, because justice can't wait, has raised $20,305,507 of our $21 million goal with gifts, gifts and pledges from 109 people, many of, of whom are here tonight. And so if you have made a gift or a pledge to UUSC Rising, please stand as you are able and let us thank you for your faith in this organization and all it does to change the world. Those who founded UUSC 75 years ago, including Waitstel Sharp, who was then minister of our congregation in Wellesley Hills, Massachusetts, and Martha Cogan Sharp, a social worker, the Sharps could never have imagined when they set out for Europe in 1939 to do what they could to rescue those at risk from the Nazis. They could never have imagined that their courage would be embodied 75 years later in an organization that stood shoulder to shoulder with the most vulnerable people in all corners of the globe. And we are thrilled that in the fall of 2016, the Sharps story, the story of the founding of UUSC, will be told on PBS stations across this country in a new documentary from the renowned producer Ken Burns and Artemis Joukowsky. And we want to show you just a very, very brief two-minute clip from that up upcoming documentary, which is entitled Righteous Among Us Two Who Defied the Nazis. It was the second Sunday night of 1939. I had done a full day's work at the church and decided to spend an evening in front of our fireplace. The telephone rang, and it was probably the most momentous telephone call that I ever received. Hello, wait still. I know whose voice it was. The voice of my closest friend, Everett Baker. Hi. Would you and Martha come over to talk with me at our house here? Yes. He said, wait still, Martha. I am inviting you to undertake the first intervention against evil by the denomination to be started immediately overseas. My husband and I felt that something should be done. Refugees in the Sudetenland had been murdered, and people had been imprisoned and hurt. We had two small kids, a very tiny daughter. I said, how many men have you offered this to? Seventeen, he said. I said, do I understand they've all turned you down? Yes. They think a war is definitely coming, and they don't want to be in danger. I reassured Martha, missionaries leave their children. I'm sure ours can be left in good hands. I want to go, but I won't go without you. I knew I would miss the children terribly, but we would only be away for a few months. I was torn between my love and duty to my children and to my husband. As my wife Martha and I went home under the starry skies, we went home with a promise to do it.
The Sharps, you know, are two of only three Americans who were honored at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as righteous among the nations. We don't know exactly how many lives the Sharps saved. Estimates range from one to 3,000, but we do know four of the people who might well not have survived without them and who went on to live lives of great meaning and purpose. Peter Bronfeld, who taught mathematics at the University of Illinois. Catherine Shivani, who taught Russian and global studies and languages at MIT. Alex Strasser, who is still practicing medicine in Rochester, New York. And Joseph Strasser, a public servant and philanthropist from Jacksonville, Florida. They are here with us tonight, and I want you to meet them. We could not be more proud or honored to have the four of you with us tonight. Catherine and Peter. Lives, lives of great meaning and celebration, great gifts to the human community. Now, I want you also to meet two other special guests who are with us tonight. First, Waitstool and Martha Sharp's daughter, Martha Sharp Joukowsky, herself a distinguished archaeologist at Brown University, who is here with us uh, with her husband, Artemis A.W. Joukowsky, the Chancellor Emeritus of Brown University. Martha. Jakowski is right here. Can you? And finally, the man whose dogged perseverance, yeah, this is the definition of doggedness, <laughs> Artemis Jakowski whose dogged perseverance in seeing to it that the story of his grandparents has been told and celebrated around the world now in this magnificent film that he and Ken Burns have co-produced. Let's thank Artemis Jokowski. <laughs> And now let's, let's take a look at some of what was born out of the Sharp's amazing story. Constance. Yes, I'm Constance Payne. I'm the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at UUSC. And I'm pleased Hi. to... All right. OK. <laughs> Good. Uh, I'm Constance Kane. I'm the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer here at U UUSC. And I'm going to, I'm pleased to introduce to you the new film that Bill was referring to. Of course, we're immensely proud of the history that was, um, you, that uh, the, the Sharps launched, but we're equally as proud of the work that we're currently doing, and we want to share that with you. We wanted to capture, in making this film, we wanted to capture not only some of the highlights of the last 75 years. For example, UUSC's pioneering role under Dick Scobie's leadership to expose U.S. collaborations with brutal right-wing regimes in El Salvador in the 1980s. But we also wanted to bring to you work that we're currently doing. Thanks to Eric Grignol of our staff who produced the video you're going to see, we can tell you th about the work that we're doing in a mere 10 minutes. If you would like to share this film with any of your congregation, just go onto our website. It's www.uusc.org. So now, UUSC, 75 years of innovation and impact for human rights.
mission is to roll back those structures of oppression in order to empower people all over the world to take control of their own lives. Over our 75-year history, our relentless work has changed lives around the globe. We turn innovative ideas into groundbreaking human rights realities. But where did it all begin? With a call to action. In 1939, Waitstill and Martha Sharp embarked on a rescue mission in Europe organized by the American Unitarian Association. From a post in Czechoslovakia, the Sharps helped dozens of children and adults targeted by the Nazis to escape to freedom. On March 15, 1939, the Nazis moved in and took the country. Trains were stopped. Everything was in the, in the country was stopped. I was going to put extraordinary effort into, and money if I had it, into uh, getting those people out. The Unitarian Service Committee, officially established in 1940, grew out of that original mission. The organization opened offices in Lisbon, Marseille, Geneva, and Paris to provide assistance, medical care, clothing, and other services for refugees. The minute we got acquainted with the Unitarian Service Committee, things got just easier and hopeful. They were people, human, absolutely human, who tried to help in the most generous way I ever thought would happen. I sure that would think what would become of us if, without the Unitarian Service Committee. Following the example of its founders, UUSC acts quickly on behalf of people whose rights are at risk due to political conflict or natural disasters. UUSC supports grassroots organizations, those groups that are highly effective but often overlooked by larger, more traditional aid organizations or by governments. We give them not only financial support, but we strengthen their leaders, we give them voice, and we support their agency. The relief operations in any country are always mounted by the majority force, by the powerful in that society. And so they have the same lenses that discriminate uh, against women, against people of color, against uh, LGBT community. We bring the lenses of race, class, and gender to our work in order to have the most impact and effect social change. For example, during World War II, when Japanese Americans were forced from their homes in the United States, UUSC established hostels for them in New York and Boston. And in the 2000s, when women in Darfur were being preyed upon in camps for displaced people, UUSC created women's centers and a training program for local police that was adopted by the United Nations. Today, UUSC continues to lift up innovation emerging out of the affected communities themselves. After the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, UUSC partnered with the Papai Peasant Movement to pioneer a new concept in sustainable living called eco-villages. Each village is home to 10 families who fled Port-au-Prince to start new lives. These families are now thriving, using sustainable farming techniques and recycled container gardens to grow food for themselves and to make a living. The first eco-village was so successful that it attracted funding for five more, plus a school and a clinic. As critical as recovery work is, UUSC believes we must dig deeper into the roots of injustice and dismantle oppressive policies to create a better world for all.
UUSC accomplishes systemic change in many ways. Partnerships with grassroots groups, funding of innovation, mobilization of our members, media campaigns, corporate accountability, litigation, and more. Let's take a closer look at one past example of policy and advocacy work. In the 1970s, UUSC supported grassroots empowerment of Salvadorans during their civil war. In response to the atrocities, UUSC sponsored fact-finding congressional delegations to El Salvador, the first by a private agency, that were instrumental in changing U.S. policy in Central America. It started with an electrifying visit from Father Drynan, a member of Congress. And Oscar Romero, we sat in his little room. And, uh, we said, what can we do? And he said, tell the world we really need help badly and nobody knows what's happening. Over 30 members of Congress, uh, both houses, we had three senators. It increased my anger because I actually saw it and saw the waste and saw the just the misdirectedness of it. There's just no doubt that a trip of this nature is exceedingly valuable. Resolutions that have to do with human rights abuses, requiring investigations, questioning where the money that we're sending to El Salvador is directed. I mean, is it directed to really helping with the development of the country? Is it economic development? Does it go to the people? And I'm convinced that our work with Congress accelerated the shift away from seeking a, mil a military solution to seeking political solutions to each of those civil wars. Human rights are the moral glue that brings all this world together. And the Service Committee has collected substantial resources over the years. It has invested these resources wisely in the advancement, if you will, of human rights. And that I think that this goes back to the roots of Unitarianism and that it has made the Unitarians uh, highly regarded in this country and around the world. Our successes have always depended on our members. Around the world, and throughout our 75 years, members have organized clothing collections, provided nursing care, offered time and expertise, and more. In 1994, UUSC created Just Works, a robust service learning program. In the United States, UUSC volunteers helped rebuild the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina. Over 2,000 volunteers repaired more than 2,300 homes in New Orleans and Biloxi. Today, UUSC continues this rich tradition of service together with the Unitarian Universalist Association through the UU College of Social Justice. At the heart of our service learning and justice journeys is our conviction that the most important service we can offer is our work for justice wherever we live. By ensuring that our local partners, those most acutely aware of the challenges they face, lead the work, UUSC volunteers become true collaborators with our human rights partners. But how do we know we're successful? Well, in three ways, because from the very beginning of every project, we articulate clear expected outcomes. Secondly, we engage in a systematic process of impact assessment. And finally, and most importantly, we learn from our mistakes. That's why dollar for dollar, UUSC is the best human rights investment you can make. And that's also why Charity Navigator gives us four stars, the highest rating it can give for transparency and efficiency. For 75 years, justice and compassion have compelled so many people to take action with UUSC. You have made our work possible. Just as Martha and Wait Still Sharp answered the call so many years ago, you are answering the call today. The call to build a world free from oppression and injustice, where all can realize their full human rights. Join us today 
and for the next 75 years as we continue to transform human rights ideals into everyday realities. Just a little taste of our history and our work today. We had invited Senator Elizabeth Warren to be with us tonight. Regardless of your politics, there are few political figures who have spoken with more eloquence of the economic injustices that UUSC seeks to remedy around the world. Well, not surprisingly, the Senator's schedule did not allow her to join us, but we're honored that she has sent us a brief video greeting. Good evening. I wish I could join you in person tonight for the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's 75th anniversary gala, but I'm afraid we're just going to have to do this one by video. I want to thank Reverend Bill Schultz for inviting me to join you this evening. Tonight's event is a great chance to recognize UUSC's work through the years as a strong voice for social justice. From its start helping victims of Nazi persecution in Europe, to its work today on behalf of marginalized communities all around the globe, UUSC has long played a critical role in protecting human rights. Your service to these, the least of thy brethren, reminds us of how people of goodwill can change the world. UUSC marks its 75th anniversary, and I'm glad to have this chance to mark the significant contributions this organization has made here in Massachusetts, throughout the nation, and around the world. Your service and your advocacy makes a real difference, helping to build opportunities for all of our families. Thank you for everything you do. And thank you, Senator. You know, we Unitarian Universalists are very good at claiming that various people of distinction are members of our faith, even though some of them have never set foot in any of our churches. <laughs> we have a pretty solid claim to John Adams and John Quincy Adams and uh, William Howard Taft and unfortunately Millard Fillmore, but <laughs> we are a bit shakier with our claims to Jefferson and Lincoln. We're on solid ground with Susan B. Anthony, Whitney Young, Melissa Harris Perry, but when it comes to musical composers, well, I, I'm sure that Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Scott Joplin were all Unitarian Universalists without knowing it, but uh, only Bella Bartok was a card-carrying member of the tribe <laughs> until until along came one of America's greatest composers and devoted Unitarian Universalist, T.J. Anderson, whom we can claim without fear of contradiction as one of our own. And we could not be more pleased that Dr. Anderson has composed a new composition which we are premiering tonight in honor of UUSC's anniversary setting to music lyrics by the distinguished former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky, who, by the way, merely by having dinner tonight with us has become a Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> so once again, the incomparable choir of the First Parish uh, in Concord, led by their superb director of music, Beth Norton, will present this magnificent new piece, Choose Your Ancestors. The lyrics are on pages six and seven of your program.
Beth Norton, and the choir of First Parish in Concord. And now let me have you meet the composer and the lyricist T.J. Anderson and Robert Pinsky. T.J., wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to say I hope you agree this has been a memorable evening, a suitable celebration of UUSC. Tonight's event, I might say, was not designed to be a fundraiser, as so many dinners like this are. But thanks to all of those sponsors listed on page four of our program brochure, beginning with our honorary co-chairs, Susan Weaver and Eric Isaacson, we've more than broken even on this occasion. We're enormously grateful to all of you for making this evening possible. I also want to thank the staff of the Weston Hotel. I think under difficult logistical circumstances, they did a great job for us tonight. I want to thank our events coordinator, Erin Griffith, and her team, and all the UUSC staff members who made this evening run so smoothly. And especially, I want to ta thank three amazing women who have worked tirelessly over the last year to make this evening possible, attending to every detail with Grace and Panache, uh, Karen Klett, Kate Friedman, and Cassandra Ryan of our staff. Let's thank them all. You're each welcome. In fact, we strongly encourage you to take home with you the small succulent plants that are at each of your table places as a gift from us, as a remembrance of this occasion, as a symbol of our work, the planting of seeds. You're also welcome. The hosts of the table are welcome to take the centerpieces or to give them to someone else. And on your way out, we will have bags for each of you with a few gifts to remember this evening. So the Concord Choir will sing a closing number and then I'll have final brief closing words. Beth Norton and the choir. to pray on if we want hope to survive in this world today then every day we've got to pray on pray on if we want hope to survive in this world today then every day we've got to pray on if we want hope to survive in this world today every day we've got to walk on
Thank you. Fantastic. Just great. What a rousing ending. Thank you so much to Beth and the choir. Uh, whenever I preach for UUSC around the country, I always use these closing words of hope and resilience. Now, therefore, since the struggle deepens, since evil abides and good does not yet prosper, let us gather what strength we have, what confidence and valor, that our small victories will eventually end in triumph, and that the world awaited will truly be a world attained. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday, UUSC. Thank you for coming. Drive safely. Good night, folks.